Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Theo Sparaboom. I'm also working for the uh, International <coughs> Labour Office, uh, partly on the same topics as uh, Irmgard is uh, working, and actually we prepared this paper uh, together, which is on productive transformation, employment, education in Tanzania. It is part of a series of case studies that we are producing on the linkages specifically on, on between structural change in countries and employment, and then in particular the quality of employment. What I would like to do is spend a few words on the economic and labor market context in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was highlighted already this morning, and the uh, peculiarities in Tanzania. And then the core of the presentation is about the changes in, in what we call education intensity, the decomposition of education intensity in Tanzania between 2001 and 2006. And we complement that with an analysis of rates of return and qualifications mismatch in the country with a specific uh, methods to look into uh, labor markets. The conclusions uh, coincide partly with what uh, Irmgard just presented, that the education advance in Tanzania barely keeps up with structural change. In other words, there's a shortage of education. And what we see is that the transformation that does take place limits or translates particularly into a stronger demand for secondary education, which is generally not sufficient for a transformation of the labor market. The situation of sub-Saharan Africa, growth, uh, sorry, productivity uh, levels among the lowest in the, in the world, but the growth of labor productivity is increasing, particularly in the past decade, and that inspired a lot of so-called Afro-optimism. Afro um, at the moment, the past 10 years, you measure that productivity growth was actually a little bit above the global average, and higher than in some re regions, such as the Middle East and Latin America. And that is a more recent phenomenon. That acceleration in labor productivity, in, uh, you can see, what we don't see is a similar acceleration in improvement of labor market outcomes. So a key labor market measure uh, for the quality of employment, which we are using, is so-called vulnerable employment rate. And that rate is indeed decreasing in sub-Saharan Africa, but at a very slow pace, only five percentage points in the past 10 years or so. So what we establish, and that is confirmed by uh, much research, is that there is no uh, commensurate uh, improvement in labor market outcomes as opposed to uh, economic development. And that is partly because of the nature of economic growth in Africa. Then looking at Tanzania, which is in a way typical of what is happening in sub-Saharan Africa, high rates of economic growth between 2001 and 2006 high rates of uh, productivity growth exceeding 3% per year, but the vulnerable employment rate only decreased by 2.6 percentage points. Then if you look at the pattern of productivity growth, then you see that at the national level, do I have a pointer here? No. At the national level, at the far right, you see that productivity growth is positive, but that if you look into your broad economic sector, as in industry and in services, it is actually negative. Only in agriculture it is positive. Meaning that your national productivity growth is driven by a reallocation of workers from agriculture into industry and services. Thanks very much, sir. <coughs> so at the national level it's positive, but in industry and in services it is negative. And I will come back to that point in a moment. <coughs> As I said, there was an, a lot of, uh, in the period between 2001 and 2006, and I should say I picked that period firstly because there was an important structural change, which you see in the distribution of labor, that is a decrease in workers in agriculture, but also because there were comparable data in these two years, which of course is important for, uh, for research. <coughs> you see... Uh, workers relocating from in agriculture to industry and services. Then 
at the bottom of the slide, we show the education intensity, and that is measured by the proportion of workers with an at least lower secondary education. And you see, generally, this proportion of workers is higher in industry and in services than in agriculture, meaning that to accommodate structural change, workers moving from agriculture to industry and services, you generally need higher levels of education. We did a decomposition exercise uh, to look at, on the one hand, the changes in education intensity that are needed uh, to accommodate intersectoral change, and on the other hand, looked at how much did the education intensity increase in sectors. I did not show the decomposition exercise itself. It is a very common methodology, <coughs> which is widely used, uh, and the details are in the, in the paper but it allows for a neat distinction between how much is needed to accommodate change between sectors and how much is actually the in education intensity increasing within sectors. Then the striking difference, if you do such a decomposition in some Asian countries, is that you see an, that most of the change in educational intensity is within sectors. So it is all above 50%. In the case of Indonesia, it is even 90% of the education intensity is within sectors. In Tanzania, we find that a large part, almost 90%, is due to change between sectors, which also means that there's very little education available to accommodate technological advance, to accommodate technological change. More generally, uh, if you just look at these country experiences, it suggests, and in particular if you look at the incomes per capita, that at low incomes per capita, much of your education is needed to uh, accommodate change between sectors, only at higher levels of income per capita, you have education that you can actually use for education, for advances in uh, technology. And interesting enough, the uh, OECD African Development Bank and two other organizations, African Economic Outlook that was just uh, released arrives at the same conclusion. So far, we only looked at total employment. Then the issue in low income countries and much of Sub-Saharan Africa I mentioned is that you have a very high rate of vulnerable employment, which means there's a lot of low quality employment. What we have tried to do is to distinguish, to do the decomposition separately for low quality and for high quality employment. Then the national picture is driven by low quality employment, by vulnerable employment. You see here there is an increase in education attainment, uh, education intensity that I mentioned before. But if you look separately, at the high productivity segment of the labor market, non-vulnerable employment, you see actually, and that is hardly visible in the, in the slide, but there's a small decrease there in the, uh, in the aggregate. And it is not so much that this decrease is small or not small. The point is, it is that it is not increasing. That means that the advance in education that was achieved by Tanzania during this period was only used to improve the productivity of the low productive segment of the labor market. While the high productive segment of the labor market, non-vulnerable employment, actually saw a decrease in educational intensity and by implication a lowering of job quality. Then, Looking at a different measure of uh, the role of education in the labor market, we did an analysis of wage returns in uh, Tanzania. Wage returns, you can only calculate for people who have wages, that is approximately 10% of the, of the workers in Tanzania. And what we find is that the pattern during this period was very much in line with the literature, the more recent literature that highlights increasing uh, or yeah, increasing returns between primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, 
So until 10 years ago, what was generally found is that the returns for education were higher in primary education, lower at the more advanced levels. But more recent lit literature suggests that the pattern has shifted, and that is what we also find in uh, Tanzania. Returns in secondary and uh, higher than in primary. Not so for tertiary education. Returns for tertiary education are relatively low. Why? Because, as I mentioned before, these wage returns are particularly relevant in the high segment, the high productivity segment of the labor market. In that segment, you saw the education intensity go down. So this basically confirms the analysis of education intensity and structural change, and you see a lower return over time. And there's also an issue of the quality in some tertiary uh, qualifications in Tanzania. We diff have, the country have, has difficulties in expanding their education system in a sustainable way and with at a sufficient high level of quality. Finally, we also looked at skills mismatch. Why? Because if you look at skills mismatch, you can look at all of your workers, as opposed to wage returns, which are only relevant for a small part of the labor market. Then the general pattern is uh, that there's a lot of discussion of overqualification in some of the advanced economies, particularly in the context of the recent economic crisis. You find increasing levels of overeducation in, uh, in some countries. In many developing countries, and in particularly low-income countries, you see high levels of underqualification. I illustrated that in the slide here. In the case of Tanzania, you find levels above 90%. And these levels are, are going down only very slowly. This is not a general pattern across all developing economies. In some Asian middle-income countries, you see uh, levels of underqualification that are far more similar to the advanced economies. But particularly in low-income countries that have, what Irmgard just mentioned, the L-shape type of educational attainment, that is mostly primary educated workers and a few secondary or tertiary educated, then you will find high levels of mismatch. We analyze this over time, and I don't have the time to show this, uh, this analysis, but if you analyze it over time, you will find that there is a particular demand for secondary educated workers, which again uh, underlines the analysis that we did on educational intensity. So what do we conclude from this analysis? Firstly, that basically educational advancement is too slow, too slow in comparison with what is happening in the real economy. The second point, if you only look at the aggregates in terms of employment, and this is what a lot of institutions are doing, including the study by the, uh, in the African Economic Outlook that I just mentioned, it may well mask the true dynamics of what is happening in the labor market, because you aggregate low quality and high quality, and you will get an, an outcome that is basically based on what is happening in the low quality segment of the, of the labor market. Well, to transform the economy, you should have a look at the high productive segment, because that is the segment that should and eventually will take the lead in terms of economic development. Uh, limited transformation trans translates into the demand for secondary education. Well, what is needed for a transformation of the labor market is more uh, tertiary education, but you don't see that happening, you don't see that demand because the transformation is not taking place. And if you want that transformation to take place, it is not sufficient to wait until this demand actually materializes. You have to, to plan for that to happen. And that is the, also the final point that I would like to make. If you develop your industrial development uh, policy, you need productive transformation patterns that create more decent jobs. And you have to align these policies <coughs> with your planned, partly with your planned development, and not only with what you're actually seeing in the labor market when you are looking back. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>